You're listening to The Corbett Report. Welcome, friends. James Corbett here. CorbettReport.com. It is. Actually, it's the 19th of February, 2019. You're probably going to be watching this at a later date because of uh, the, the way that this is being released and timing and all of that. But, boy, do we have a conversation for you today. And it's going to be on a subject... That will either be really interesting and fun for people, or will be an immediate snooze fest. So choose now and uh, and live with that decision. But to join us for this conversation, we're going to have a guest that I hope you'll know by now. It's Vinny Caggiano, better known as Vin Cognito on YouTube and elsewhere, and he is a a composer, a music theorist, a music teacher. Someone who's been around music his entire life, and who you can listen to his music online or buy the CD, including a brand new CD called Razzmatazz, which I am very much looking forward to listening to. I understand my CD is in the mail, mail. so I haven't heard it yet. (laughs) But I understand you just had the CD release. Vinny, how did that go? Uh, Well, you know, my ears got so tired of listening to it day after day after day and trying to refine and make better and all this. And by the end of it, I was utterly disappointed. And I thought, oh, this sucks, you know. And uh, I don't know. I've been getting really rave reviews from people about it, people that have listened to it. So I actually listened to the to it the other day, and I thought, okay, yeah, this is pretty good. I like it, you know. Like so, it. so. <laughs> you're your own worst yeah. critic. But I understand when you're you're seeing something or doing, you're working on something day after day after day. At a certain point, you're just like, I don't want to see it anymore. I don't want to hear it. Well, <laughs> it's hard to look objective. You know, to kind of ease into the subject we're talking about, I have a dear friend who uh, she is a uh, big Beatles fan, and um, when I told her I was disappointed with my record, I said, you know, I, I wanted this to be as good as a Beatles record. And she said, Vinny, you're no Beatles. And I was like, I beg your pardon? (laughs) (laughs) I hate to break it to you, but it's probably true. (laughs) I got to keep trying. Yes. For those who don't know, today we are going to be talking about the Beatles. And this is, of course, the context in which I first found you on YouTube talking and analyzing Beatles songs. And I introduced people to your uh, channel during my Truth Music uh, episode in 2000. 18? 17, maybe. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know. Time flies. It was a while ago. And uh, and so we've talked about the Beatles before, but we're going to really delve in today in a way that combines a couple of my different worlds. One is Beatledom, and the other is conspiracy lore. Well, boy, do those, uh, those two meet. And <laughs> my God, it's not surprising. Uh, the Beatles were arguably the largest pop cultural phenomenon in history up to that point in the 1960s. The world had arguably never really seen anything quite like that before. It was clearly a product of mass media coming together in a certain way and perhaps darker darker forces leading the way, um, something that obviously we're going to be broaching today. But whatever it was, it was a mania, and it continues, obviously. Everyone knows the Beatles, at least passingly, and has absorbed it as part of the pop cultural zeitgeist. And along with that, and along with that level of fame, of course, comes conspiracy theories galore. And in fact, in preparing for this conversation... Both Vinny and myself discovered new conspiracy theories about the Beatles that we hadn't even heard of before. There's so much to get into um, with regards to this, and this can get dark. There are definitely some dark forces and matters to be talked about, but let's try to set the tone of this conversation in a little bit more lighthearted manner. I wanted to start, Vinny, by talking about some of the fun or funniest or silliest Beatles conspiracy theories that are floating around out there, and I have my own particular one, but were there any that struck out to you as particularly laughable? Or well, the one that immediately comes to mind is the drummer Bernard Purdy saying that he played on 25 Beatles tracks replacing Ringo Starr. I, that, to me, is just... You know, there's something about his personality. I've met people like this before. This guy has an astronomical ego, and he's just... I think he played on two or three tracks, if, if that. And uh, he blew it up to 25. And I know people who do this. Their egos are so huge that they lie to themselves and believe their lies. You know, So that, that one to me is hilarious. I'm yeah. sorry, Bernard. Yeah. I mean, but it does raise a question. Do you think there's a possibility there were secret session musicians brought in for these tracks? Oh, without I don't think secret for the sake of secrecy, but certainly from the very beginnings. I mean, we didn't know that George Martin played piano on many of the tracks of the Beatles. 
Um, and then later on, of course, when they got more explorational, um, you know, within you, without you on um, Sgt. Peppers. I mean, that's a whole group of Indian uh, classical musicians that played on that. We don't know their names, you know. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So there are, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's openly known uncredited musicians on their yep. albums. But, you know, did. Did Ringo really play all those drums? Well, we know he didn't play on the original 1962 recording of Love Me Do, but... Yeah. yeah. Um, well, for my uh, my funny, fun, just isn't it kind of laughable um, Beatles conspiracy theory, I will throw out Everyday Chemistry, which some people <laughs> might have heard of, but if you haven't, uh, I almost hesitate to bring it up because this is so clearly just a silly story that was invented someone as a marketing gimmick to get people to look at his mixtape, essentially. It's a DJ made a mixtape of post-Beatles mashup of different songs from the, you know, George Solo, Paul Solo, career, blah, 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 mashed them up together into songs. And there's this whole story about this this. guy that was out, what was it, he was like hiking and he hit his head and suddenly he wakes up and he's in this other dimension or universe where the, the, the Beatles hadn't broken up and he gets to hear their, 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 their newest album in whatever this was, 19... 83 or whatever it was and it's wow it's all this like beatles music but it's it's all i mean it's paul's solo song max mashed up with george solo song mashed up with john solo song and i don't know i mean i'm no dj i don't i don't listen to mashups it it seems pretty well done i mean it's it's at least entertaining for a minute or two but (laughs) it's clearly a ridiculous story about a parallel universe and everything that i just think no one i mean no one really believes this but it's a good way to get attention to your work i guess it's uh by the way it's barely listenable i find it i had it really hard it hurt to listen to it um it's a wash and well it's because you know all of the different songs right. too you know, well it's like it, well right. yeah it's like i'm not hearing anything new here i'm just hearing mashups of exactly. songs I've heard, yeah, yeah. It, that's the way yeah that story it's a great marketing gimmick but in a way it almost damages it because if it would if i just approached it as a mashup i could listen to it as a mashup but trying to make me think oh this is actually the beatles in a room together recording these songs <laughs> but you know it's different songs that are being mashed together <laughs> so yeah i keep thinking about that so i can't really enjoy it although actually you brought up an, another interesting there's a bunch of it was secretly the beatles rumors out there um one that people probably have heard of i i've certainly heard of it was the masked marauders which was supposedly an album that the beatles secretly recorded with Bob Dylan and Mick Jagger and some others, I think, were supposedly on this recording, and it was passed off as being this, you know, secret Beatles album. Um, It turned out to be just a few guys having fun and impersonating some of their favorite musicians, but, uh, and, and there's a long history of that. But you brought up one I'd never even heard of before, which is Klaatu? Oh, yeah, yeah. Before we go to Klaatu, just one comment about the um, everyday chemistry it would make a great episode of Doctor Who, don't you think? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I would watch no, that. Yeah, no, no complaint here. Yeah. <laughs> but Clat Two, now there's a good one. That that's a fun one. Um, but again, like uh, what we're gonna mention in the near future, the uh, George Harrison tape. Uh, this is so obviously. Not the Beatles. Do you, do you want to tell the story about Clat Two? Like, oh, please, you 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 go ahead. Uh, I don't have all the like details, but I think it was a Canadian man, if I'm not mistaken. Was it a Canadian man? Leave it to the Canadians, man. Uh, <laughs> anyway, Clat Two was a band that was kind of uh, they they kind of arrived in the early '70s, around '72, after the Beatles had broken up for a couple of years, and. Um, they put a lot of, I have to say, the music is decent. They put a lot of work into what they were doing. And some people claimed, maybe because of the use of orchestral instruments, violins, and things like this, that they people were starting to think it sounds like the Beatles. Somebody claimed that uh, the lead singer sounded just like Paul McCartney. He sounds nothing like Paul McCartney. Have you listened to the Beatles, dude? So, you know, not sure about that. But in any case, you know, there was an ongoing uh, thing about it. And back in those days, there wasn't the Internet, but it made it finally to the Internet. And um, 
what had happened was somebody wanted to end the rumor for once and for all that this was the Beatles secret recording that they, they the Beatles, the, the story is they re got, they rebanded together and created an album, but they wanted to remain anonymous because, uh, uh, what was the reasoning behind that? Oh, they, I think it had to do with, they wanted to be known for their work and not for their image, something like that. Well, that's partially true. Ben Clett, too, wanted to be known for their work and their image. Um, there's a lot of mystery around Clett, too, because they refuse to put the, uh, their names on the albums, who wrote the songs. They purposely eliminated all information about them for the sole purpose of, hey, we're putting this out here. Buy it for its own sake. If you like this record, you don't need to know who we are. And that was it. But then the rumors began to spread that it was secretly the Beatles putting together a record. And um, one, I forget if it was a journalist, decided to, for once and for all, find out what this was about. So uh, he went to the, uh, the Library of Congress, library of Congress or somewhere. to find out who had the copyright on the music. He found the name of the guy. And yeah, it wasn't Paul McCartney or any of the Beatles. Yeah, they tracked them down. They're now known. And I guess they're somewhat famous because the Carpenters covered their calling all interplanetary <laughs> craft, whatever. I don't know. I don't know. I, I I did check out the album. I listened to a few songs. I checked out at Anus of Uranus, which was not doing oh. it for me. But yeah, anyone who could for a second say that that was the Beatles' voices? Right. Sorry, just absolutely no way. Absolutely. Vocally, not at all, <laughs> even in the ballpark. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. A a a again, I, being the conspiratorial type, I think if that rumor about Klaatu being secretly the Beatles wasn't started by Klaatu's marketing department, then then they should fire their marketing department because it was a great way to get people to check out Klaatu. Oh, why on earth would we even be talking about them if there hadn't been that secret rumor that was floated? So, <laughs> and and there goes the moral to the story: is it's so easy, like uh, to to create this air of mystery and then bring about this sense of oh, this happened, this really happened, you know, and, and this is how a lot of conspiracy theories start. Yes, and that's why I'm choosing to call this conversation everything I know about conspiracies I learned from the Beatles, <laughs> because there are so many valuable lessons we can learn about conspiracy theorizing and how it propagates and why, and, and there's a lot of different things we can learn from the the, the admittedly silly, crazy conspiracies that are thrown out there and sometimes just clearly for marketing purposes and then others that may have merit to them and we'll have to weigh them on their merits. But uh, there's a lot to, to ponder here. You know, James, I was thinking you should do a podcast on how to make a conspiracy work because you've done so yeah, much research. This might be it, actually, because I think we're, we're kind of looking at that <laughs> from certain perspectives. Like, one, if you're a no-name band, why don't you just go anonymous and secretly float the rumor that you're, you know, it's Radiohead's side project or whatever, and let the marketing machine do the work for you. I mean, hey, why not? I have a real esoteric question for you. Um, I have to ask you, do you know the one band that created a song that is virtually indistinguishable from the Beatles? Is this a trick question? No, it's or a, is this a serious It's I'll uh, give you a big hand. It uh, sounds like the early it came out in the days of the early Beatles and it sounds like early Beatles. Tell me. All right. For you folks out there, get onto YouTube and type in the word lies and the band is the Knickerbockers. And I'm surprised I haven't sent you a, a um this song. It sounds the writing the execution, the lead singer sounds like Lennon. It is really amazing. And these guys are from like Boston. The Knickerbockers. I think it was I the Knickerbockers. Heard yeah, of yeah. I'll send it to you after the show. You got to hear it. It's awesome. I mean, that, that was the only time that I really thought that was the Beatles when it wasn't. When it wasn't. Right. Oh, but have you heard Billy Pepper and the Pepper Pots? <laughs> <laughs> it's Paul, I tell you. All right. Well, let's get to what everyone's waiting for. Paul is dead, right? I mean, we're not talking about Paul McCartney. We're talking about Fall, right? right? Fall. <laughs> did you uh, did you happen to catch the video? Um, oh, you know, all right. There's a video of George Harrison in an interview 
And he refers to Paul a couple of times, but the third time he says his name, he says Paul instead of Paul, apparently, you know. Uh, so that got the guys all, you know, oh, there it is. He, yeah, there it is. There it is. Yeah, there it is. There it is. Well, I, I will have to see that for myself, because I know that some people take the anthology extras, and there's a scene where there there's the three of them, um, Paul, J George, and Ringo, sitting around a table, and I guess George says something like, Hello, William? According to some people. Yeah. But then other people say, No, he's saying, Hello, you. So, I don't know. And I know that they also take all sorts of things out of context. Uh, 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 there's the scene from The Making of Imagine, um, where George and John are together along with some other people are having breakfast, and they're talking about Beetle Ed and Beetle Phil and things like this. They're just playing around, and Beetle Phil is a reference to Phil Spector, who is at the table with them eating, who is part of the Imagine production, who obviously also produced the Beatles with Let It Be, and so they're talking about this, but people will take that clip out of context and say it's Beetle Bill oh. that he's saying, not Beetle oh. Phil. It's Beetle Bill, which of course is a reference to not Paul McCartney, but William Campbell, Bill, i.e. Billy Shears, i.e. Paul is dead. And and it's just funny to know that that's being manipulated, misrepresented, misheard, or people are too stupid to know that what they're doing um, when they're doing that. But I have the piece of Paul is dead factual evidence for you that's going to blow you away. Did you know, on the Imagine album, John actually sings, Those freaks was right when they said you was dead. I mean, that's it. That's it. He, he said, said it. it. Oh, my God. Unbelievable. Oh Proof God. positive. And actually, that's my favorite part of the making of Imagine documentary, where he's showing George that song for the first time and he's just playing it on piano it. and he looks at George and he's beaming when he sings that line because it's just, he knows he's sticking the knife into Paul's heart because uh, obviously that was a reaction song to a song that Paul, had, it was a diss track it was a beef that was happening <laughs> in the 70s and that line is meant in that context but of course it's proof positive yep. that Paul is yep. dead right? Yes indeed um, uh you know, uh, first, I grew up in that era, so I, you know, I uh, played Revolution Number no. 9 backwards on a stereo. I actually did that. I remember the day I did that, the night I did that with a couple of friends. And, uh, yeah, you could hear, turn me on, dead man, turn me on, dead man. If, but you could, you know, whenever you do a reverse thing, it, it could be any number of things that they're saying. Uh, I guess, as, as your audience could surmise by now, neither one of us believe that Paul died in 1966 but here's the thing all right so so what 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 would make it plausible that paul did actually die he supposedly died in a moped accident or i think it was a moped accident or a car crash car it was crash a car crash is the one that i hear most oh i've heard i've heard every variation you can think of one of which was either a plane crash or it was staged to look like a plane crash in which not only paul but also brian died and Brian was replaced not by one, but by two different doubles, one of which dropped out of being a double, and the other of which was murdered and covered up like a drug overdose. And then you know... <laughs> so, I mean, literally everything you can imagine has been alleged, but the main one that people go with is car crash, in which Paul was decapitated. Well, he blew his mind out in a car. He didn't notice that the lights had changed. Ooh, right? But then... And, and there's another one. Uh, no one, nobody was really sure if he was from the house of Paul! <laughs> oh, what? Or is it Lords? I hear Lords, but no, hey, whatever. Wait. People are saying he's actually saying Paul? Yeah, that's a huge one. A lot of people say House of Paul. No. I don't hear it at all, but whatever. Uh, that's really strange. <laughs> you know, one, one that I heard that was plausible to me was that um, Paul was alive in this one, but he uh, did the song Blackbird, and somebody said if you listen to the last, I think it's the third or the last verse of Blackbird, you can tell it's a different singer than Paul. And when I heard it and I listened really closely, you know who it sounded like? James Taylor. And I thought to myself, well, that's when when uh, Apple, the Apple company, imported James Taylor was around that time, and could it? It could be one of two things, like Paul had him sit in and, and do 
you know, do a verse. Or it could be that um, Paul was, so he was a mockingbird. He could copy anybody. So maybe he was just so influenced by his style that he kind of sounded like him in the way he elocuted the thing. Yeah. I mean, Paul did have an incredible range of voices from Little Richard to, you know, the Hey Jude voice to Get Back was an entirely different mm -hmm. voice to Oh Darling. Mm -hmm. He had a quite a range of different voices he could do. Yes, yes. Now, on the on the plausible side, I mean, I've thought of both sides of this. You know, I my philosophy kind of matches Robert Anton Wilson's, which is um, try on a belief system for a while just to see how it fits and then toss it away. And don't hold on to any one particular belief system. Just try on different ones and feel them out. And that's what I've always done. So I was on the side of, for a while, I was on the side of Paul could be dead, you know. And uh, anyway, um, oh, God, I forgot where my train of thought was going. Oh, the, the plausible side of it. From the business perspective, if Paul had been in an accident the Beatles were such a huge money machine at that point that it seems to me that it would be likely that they'd, they'd scramble for someone who could take Paul's place and you know someone probably would have the outlandish idea let's find a body double but the chances of three things someone who looks exactly like Paul right who writes incredibly well and sings incredibly well it's just, it just seems so ridiculously unlikely. Let's add another layer of incredulity to that. Um, being covered up by everyone in his life for the rest of his life, unless right. you, you know, say, oh, George, you know, gestured to it in some interview where he said, fall, trust me on that one or whatever. But essentially everyone playing along with it, including John Lennon, who, as we all know, would be happy to just play along and never say a word about oh, it. Oh, right? yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he was just the type that would just lay over, roll over and do whatever the corporate bigwigs told him, right? <laughs> you know, I should have dug it up for you, James. I, I forgot all about this. In my research, I ran into a video of, um, you know, Paul McCartney was a pretty uh, sexually active dude. I mean, he really liked his women. And um, this one guy was interviewed who it's like an hour and a half long, who claims to be the illegitimate son of Paul McCartney. And he knows for a fact that Paul is dead. And he came out and talked about Paul being dead and the whole story and blah, 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 blah. But, uh, well, there's a few illegitimate children's stories out there regarding Paul. One of which had a blood test, I think that proved that they, that Paul wasn't the father, yeah, something like but that. that's proof yeah. that Paul's dead right. because clearly Paul right. was the father Paul is not the father. <laughs> so this is proof. Because this illegitimate child story doesn't check out, it's proof that Paul is dead. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. There's a lot of circular reasoning that goes on here. And look, let's put it this way. I don't have a dog in the fight. If, if there is, I mean, if Paul McCartney really did die and was replaced, that to me would be so mind-blowing, so amazing, that they replaced him with someone who wrote, arguably, at least to the level of music that Paul was writing before, if not <laughs> several levels above that. But then again, were the Beatles really writing the Beatles music? Oh, well, no. Obviously, oh. it was Theodore Adorno or those really creative cats over at the Tavistock Institute who really know their music, <laughs> you know. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, I'm so ready to sink my teeth into Let's this. Let's do. One. Let's Theodore do. Adorno wrote the Beatles. What do you think, Vinny? Uh... Well, here's the story is that Theodore Dorno, for a short period of time in the early career of the Beatles, owned their catalog. And I think that that's not true. That wasn't... 100% not oh. true. Show me a shred of evidence there, uh, all that right, that there, is true. All no. right, cool. No, he didn't. He never did. That's the thing. That's why I think people find this plausible, is there's these lies that are in just put into this story to make it sound plausible. Well, why did Adorno own the Beatles if he didn't write their catalog? 
He didn't own the Beatles. <laughs> Never. You can trace the ownership of the Beatles catalog uh, specifically with Northern Songs, which was a creation with Dick James, and Paul, John and Paul had a piece of that. And then Dick James sold his share to something that became ATV, which then bought out Paul and John. ATV gets bought out by Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson gets bought out by Sony. You can trace the lineage every step along the way. Theodore Adorno's name appears... Nowhere. Nowhere. Wow. Theodore Adorno died in 1969. He didn't have a piece of the Beatles catalog when he died. There's nothing, literally not one shred of evidence for that, but it has been inserted into the story by people who are, I think, trying to create something out of nothing. All right. So here, all right. This is an interesting point because um, Theodore Adorno, he's an interesting character, actually. I don't know if you looked into his writings and things like this. Um, I'd be curious why... Somebody tried to start the rumor that he owned the catalog because that aside, that aside, Theodore Adorno would be a, a favorite amongst conspiracy theorists because he talked about popular music. He was this guy was a classically trained music theorist and he was a heavyweight and he talked about repetition in music, especially popular music. He wrote a number of treatises on pop, pop music for the sake of uh, altering the minds and influencing the minds of the listener, mind control, right? That, that big charged word. So I could see why, like, uh, a conspiracy theorist might kind of make that connect. He was German, right? And the Beatles played in Germany, so there's a connection, you know, you know. But it's really stretching it. It really is. However, Theodore Adorno is worth looking into not for the sake of the conspiracy theory of, of behind the Beatles, but just because he's an interesting character. Absolutely he is, and he's part of the Frankfurt School, which is regaining attention with people focusing on the Frankfurt School and its various philosophical uh, leanings and how that might have been might play out to this very day with the SJW thing and everything that's going on. But, uh, yeah, you're exactly right. It is interesting. But he was, I mean, uh, again... I, I'm going to venture to guess that 99% of the people who talk about Theodore Adorno has never read a single word he's ever written. So <laughs> that, that might be the first place that people might want to start. Actually read about the sociology of music and other things that he wrote about. Um, yeah, some interesting stuff, but uh, a couple of things to bring up. One of which was that he was particularly interested in atonal music. Um, Schoenberg and all that. And so he, and he did his own compositions of atonal music. But, um, and, and so the conspiratorial people who brought that into the Beatles mix and said it's Tavistock slash Adorno slash the Aquarian conspiracy, and they wrote all the music, accused the Beatles of being atonal. But other than maybe, you know, Revolution 9 or something, I, again, for people who don't know, what, what is atonal music? What does that even mean? That means you can't find a root. In other words, you can't find a chord to relax on in any place in the music. It will always make, keep you feeling... Uh, on edge because there's uh, no sense of rest in any of the music. It's all based on dissonance. And of course, you know, back in the day when it was a big thing, there were arguments, philosophical sophistry about, well, maybe there's no such thing as dissonance. Maybe everything is music. You know, maybe the noise you're hearing outside is music. Eh, I mean, that's kind of getting a little, I, I had a big argument back in my high school days with a cello player about that very subject. Consonance and dissonance exist just as much as big planets have a lot of gravity and smaller planets have less. That is a law of nature, and I think that law of nature exists within music itself. Yeah, yeah. Um, it did make for some interesting sort of philosophical ventures in classical music in the early 20th century, but I wouldn't... I wouldn't encourage people to listen to it for, you know, entertainment purposes. It's, uh, yeah, it's not really fun to listen to. Um, what's the difference between atonal and 12-tone? They're, they're almost interchangeable. 12-tone includes a very, very specific method, all right? Let's say you had the numbers from, oh, the numbers from 1 to 12, which is the entirety of tones that we have in our system, 12 tones, right? Um the rules of dodecaphonic music, 12-tone music, are that you cannot repeat one of the tones until the entire cycle of 12 is through. So I could go from 1 to the number 5 to the number 6 to the number 4, but I can't go back to 5 until I get to all the other 12 numbers. Um, I have a theory about this, that music 
it's, it's kind of an interesting phenomenon. Music is asymmetrical. It's not symmetrical. And when you force it to be symmetrical, you lose root. You get chaos. And I, I think the same is true for society. If you try to make it, you know, order out of chaos, put everything nice in an order, you're going to get uh, a pushback from it. You know, you're going to get chaos just from the sake of trying to create order uh, or symmetry. Tangent of a tangent of a tangent of a tangent here, but just theoretically, could you come up with a 12-tone composition that is tonal, that has a root? No, but um, no. And atonal doesn't go by the strict rules of dodecaphonic music as as prescribed by um, Arnold Schoenberg, but atonal uh, music does go out of its way to avoid a root. Now, I I don't know if there's a word for it, but there's something between atonal and tonal music. There's this one conspiracy theory guy. I don't know why I love this guy. Um, he's just completely nuts, and you can tell he is. But he has these, um, he believes, what he does is he takes high-resolution NASA photographs and of the different various planets, right? And he zooms in and he shows you where there are these cities inside craters. And he believes that there is life on every planet in the solar system, including some asteroids, right? I just love the idea. I, I adore the idea. I, see, to me, conspiracy theory is what I call free science fiction. I, like when I watch, I'm a big fan of Doctor Who. When I watch that series, I become like a kid. I want to believe everything, even though it's the wackiest science you could imagine. You know, I just want to believe it. Uh, which I th- every day, chemistry. yeah, yeah, and I, I think that's <laughs> there is a parallel universe where they didn't break up. <laughs> what is the fire that perpetuates a conspiracy theory? What is the thing that fans that fire? It's the people's desire for it to be true. You know, Sometimes. well, in the case of the Beatles, Not it is. Not well, well, often. Yeah, I mean, but, uh, yeah, there's a confluence of factors that come in. All right, let's, okay, well, we've had a little bit of fun. Let's get into some of the darker and serious stuff, and stuff that I, I do think there's something to. The extent to which the Beatles were a manufactured phenomenon, and for certain purposes, or at least steered in certain directions for the masses, because they clearly were agents of change, wittingly or not. Um I want to broach this by telling a little story, if you'll indulge me for a moment. Something that always amuses me um, when I'm looking at some of these, like Paul is Dead. And I will basically, whenever I'm listening to someone talking about this, I will count how many minutes it is before they say something that shows, demonstrates that the, this person has never cracked a book on this subject, doesn't, doesn't know what they're talking about. Um, right. One example that stuck out recently, I was watching a video where someone said, oh, look, Paul Fall McCartney uh, here in his this footage. He's like a 70 year old man. It must have been a few years ago, whatever. Um, he goes up to this uh, other musician and he takes his trumpet and he starts playing when the saints go marching in. How did Paul Mac- Paul McCartney couldn't even read music and he didn't play the trumpet. What's going on here? This isn't Paul McCartney. It's Fall. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> Which is stupid because anyone who knows anything about the biography of Paul McCartney knows his first instrument was the, was trumpet. the trumpet. And in fact, yep. If I hadn't seen that footage, I could have told you if he picked up a trumpet, the song he would play is When the Saints Go Marching In, because that was the first song that he learned. That was the song that he he practiced and he studied and he got it so he could actually play it. And, little bonus, listen to When the Saints Go Marching In, then listen to I Saw Her Standing There. I think you'll find some interesting musical parallels that may have been unconscious, but anyway. Oh, cool, I will. I'll give that a listen. That's an awesome idea. And when the saints go marching in. Anyway, I think think there might have been some uh, musical influence going on there. But anyway, uh, again, uh, time after time after time after time, it's just funny to watch that when you see someone who clearly doesn't know that they are revealing that they don't know what they're talking about. Um, That's an interesting moment that occurs, uh, at least for me, because I have done some research on the video. I know the story, and I know the sources and documents where you can point to this and that, and if you knew what you were talking about, you would be able to do it. One of the sources is, I think I might have talked about this once before, but I'll I'll introduce it again. It's called uh, The Beatles Tune-In which is the first volume of a proposed three-volume series on the Beatles. And 
Uh, it's by Mark Lewison, who's considered, like, the historian of the Beatles. He's the world-renowned expert on everything to do with the Beatles. Um, and it's insane. It is objectively insane oh, down, <laughs> to own I this. I mean, he counts breadcrumbs the, that fell off their pieces of toast. I mean, he's amazing, yeah. I mean, he's amazing. The yeah. trade paperback version of this book is 800... 90 pages or something. But I don't have the trade paperback version. I have the special edition, which is, in fact, two volumes. It's split into two volumes. This is everything you need to know about the Beatles biography pre-1963. <laughs> so this does not even get to Beatlemania, yeah. and it's over yeah. 1,300 pages. Yeah. <laughs> and I read it for light bedtime reading, so that's how crazy I am. But <laughs> this is actually a good inroad to this story, because... Um, as some people who are familiar with Beatles conspiracy lore might know, there has been a rumor, basically ever since the beginning, that the only reason the Beatles ever trend, uh, actually charted with Love Me Do, which is objectively not that great a song, uh, I, I don't like it at all. I guess in the context of 1962, maybe it sounded Well, that right, was before it, Tavistock I, stepped I, in and started writing their music for them. Well, there you go. It started writing their songs, right? <laughs> Which is another example of how I know people don't know what they're talking about. But we'll come back to that. Anyway, um, uh, there, was the, there was the rumor that the reason that they charted in the first place with that song was Brian Epstein, their manager, also a record store owner, uh, personally purchased 10,000 copies of the album to or the, the single to get it charting. And um, that's... That's actually, or at least fiddled with the numbers somehow to get it charting, which is at least given some plausibility. Yeah. He was a record store yeah, and owner, he was a businessman. And man. his record and stores actually man. did contribute numbers, or did, did contribute to the national charts at that time. So, you know, a little bit of fiddling to make sure that his his band that got band, on the yeah. Sounds reasonable, yeah. right? So it's, that's a reasonable conspiracy theory until you find out how the charts were actually compiled at that time, which is something that... Um, oh, I love this. The uh, James Corbett treatment. I love this. <laughs> <laughs> so on page 1,377 <laughs> of this light <laughs> bedtime reading, <laughs> uh, he talks about this this rumor and, and in the context of talking about Love Me Do and how... You know, it charted nationally on, from its first week of release. It got in 49, number 49 on the top 50 charts, which was quite an accomplishment for this completely unheard of band from Liverpool. Uh, they ultimately got to, I think, number 19 on the national charts in England there with Love Me Do. And he says, uh, so freakish was all of this. Rumors quickly took grip that Brian was hyping the chart, buying in boxes of Love Me Do to fake its position. The strongest story had him buying 10,000. It was a rumor that clung, despite Brian trying to shake it off. No one would believe he hadn't, and denial only fed suspicion. And it wouldn't be long before the whole business was talking about it, unfairly casting a blight on his integ integrity because it wasn't true. As John Lennon would explain, it, love me do, sold so many in Liverpool the first two days because they were all waiting for us to make it, that the dealers down in London thought there was a fiddle on. Uh, that Mr. Epstein, Epstein feller up there is cheating, but he wasn't. Uh, many in Liverpool felt sure of it, too. As the Beatles began to go uh, go national, so Brian began to find he had, had fewer friends than he thought. Uh, gossip about the 10,000 was traded maliciously and without proof by people jealous of his success or keen to claim insider status. No one considered Brian, Brian's membership of the committee that challenged suspicions of chart malpractice or his resistance to faking My Bonnie, which the Beatles recorded with Tony Sheridan, uh, into even his own shops published top 20. His own shops published top 20. Or most striking of all, the fact that in 1962, it made no difference how many copies a shop sold of any record because the charts weren't computed that way. NEMS, which was Brian's Company, uh, yeah. retailing Company, record yeah. retailer, had been a chart return operation for years. It still provided data to Melody Maker and also now to Record Retailer, but those papers' weekly phone calls or printed questionnaires didn't ask for sales figure, figures, only for a shop's best-selling records ranked from 1 to 30. The papers awarded 30 points to the number one record, down to one point for the number 30, and calculated an overall national total. All the charts were produced this way, as they still were in America at that time. Brian Epstein had no need to buy 10,000 Love Me Do's to fake it into the charts. He didn't even need to buy one. 
he did buy a couple of thousand store copies because the majority of Beatles fans wanted to buy it from NEMS three stores, and because he was the manager and agent of this band, and EMI had sent him one free copy. So, anyway, long story short, the the ten thousand copies rumors completely it doesn't even it's not even relevant to the calculation of the charts at that time. If he'd wanted to fake it, he would have just said it was the number one selling store album at a store, which in reality it probably was because the Beatles were provably the largest band in Liverpool at that time. There's lots of different indications you could get of that. But anyway, it's just, that's one example of how what you don't know can actually have a huge bearing on what what this theory that you're propounding. And you don't even know to not know that you don't know what you don't know. <laughs> I mean, who knows how the record charts were compiled in 1962? Well, this Mark here. Lewison knows. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if you do the actual research, you can find out and you can figure out, oh, well, actually that... There's not even a basis for believing that. But you, again, you don't know what you don't know. And that's, I think that tells us something important about conspiracy theories and how they can propagate even when there's zero proof to back them up. But as I say, this is an inroad to the larger conversation about the Beatles being a manufactured pop cultural phenomenon, which I'm very much sympathetic to that idea. I think Beatlemania was engineered to some extent. Yes. Um, yeah. But by whom and for what purposes? Vinny? Well, it's pretty well known, like when the Beatles arrived on American shores, they, they purposely got a bunch of women to greet them at the airport. You know, like, oh, look at this. Now, the question is why? Somebody had an agenda to make them famous, you know. But as far as their involvement in some uh, secret society or every, whatever you want to call it, I don't I think it happened, but I think it happened much later. I think they were kind of at the business end of something and they were steered to an extent, but not so much until Sergeant Peppers rolled along and they realized these, these boys have an effect on the entire generation. We've got to step in and steer what they do. You know, I do believe that did happen. And, you know, yeah, I agree. I think Beatlemania was a, a business yeah. manufactured. But that, that you know, sounds like wholesome and, uh, when you think about it. That's like, that's wholesome. Yeah. It's just business. Yeah, we're trying to make them famous. You know, we're trying to make money. That, that to me makes right. sense, you know, especially from those days, right. you know. Okay, so why then Sergeant Pepper and how? All right, well, you, you know, here is where my instincts kick in and not so much, you know, my analysis. There's something... There's something dark about that era uh, in the Beatles. Um, you know, they disappeared in the studio for, for a year. There's a darkness to that alone, like a mystery to it. And, of course, people were thinking they broke up and, you know, the rumors started flying. But, um, you know, a lot of it has to – you have to connect back to the Paul is dead thing too because don't forget, you have all the clues and they show up on Peppers. All right, Um but, you know, can I make a quick side note here about uh, Paul is Dead? Um, I started researching. We're not done with that. <laughs> oh, good, good. Because I, I started to research dates. That was important to me. I once heard in an interview, um, somebody once asked him, what was the song that changed everything for you? Like you knew your style was going in a totally new direction. And Paul said, Eleanor Rigby. So then, you know, I was of the Paul is Dead mindset at the time. And I thought, hmm. Maybe that's the new Paul, right? But then I checked the dates. Paul McCartney supposedly died on November 9th, I think it was, of 1966. Now, the conspiracy theorists are going back to yesterday and today, and Paul's sitting in a box, and that means a coffin. Well, that was prior to the time he supposedly died. So, oh, yeah. But I think they cover that by saying that he had premonitions of his death. Oh, a good cover would be, well, it's Illuminati, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, predictive programming. Foreshadowing. Yeah, Yeah. right, right, right. Uh, Well, either way, I mean, (laughs) we can wave over any problems with chronology with that. (laughs) But, uh, you know, when you you, uh, think about, well, the new Paul would write differently, well, I'm sorry, but Eleanor Rigby was also written before Paul died, so supposedly died, so... You know, I, just looking at the dates alone of the album releases and what they're saying in comparison to that makes me think, God, you know, at least get your facts straight. You know? Great. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's another thing. Um, yeah, exactly. I mean, there's so many things to go into with the Paul is Dead thing, including the only thing that's really intriguing to me is the possibility that from 
photographic analysis or whatever, we can see actual biological changes, and this is a different human being, which supposedly there was that Italian Wired magazine oh, scientists mm -hmm. that went in trying to prove it was the same guy, and they, they proved that it was actually a different guy. That's interesting to me, but I don't read Italian, so I don't know specifically what they were looking I at. I saw an argument. Um, but I don't, again, I don't know, when it comes to photographic analysis, there's so many different things to go into, including the fact that everyone thinks that they are experts in looking at photographs and being able to tell when they a lot of people don't know the first thing about lenses and lighting and angle and all of these things and how they can drastically change what someone looks like and again people who don't know that they don't know won't believe me on that but i uh, there's many examples that you can show of the same person from the same distance from the camera just with different lenses looking like a different human being depending on the lens that is being used um let alone people doing height analysis oh look you know paul it was shorter than fall because this and this when they're doing height analysis of pictures where you can't see the <laughs> bottom torso you can't see where they're standing you can't i mean that's completely yeah. <laughs> meaningless yeah. in terms of analyzing someone's height when you can't see where their feet mm -hmm. are because you don't know how to mm -hmm. tell there things like this actually i found a really interesting video when i was researching this um the whole paul is dead thing is like a sunk cost fallacy to me uh, because i so there's got to be something here because so many people talk about it and they, there must be something i'm missing here so i keep looking and looking and looking <laughs> and i never come up with anything but i f found an interesting video from someone who i guess believes in some version of paul was replaced but he he's not one of those paul is deaders mm -hmm. or something i don't know but anyway he was showing how the height discrepancy that people talk about no that was actually you could see that from 1963 you know, before this whole Paul is dead nonsense. Wow. So he was showing different photographs where there was... Yeah. Anyway, and, and showing how the, the photographs that the Paul is dead people use to prove that he's of different height are manipulated and he shows different photos from the same day at a different angle and stuff. I'll throw the link in the show notes for people who are interested. I will also throw the link in the show notes to the definitive proof that we all need that Paul is still alive, but not Paul McCartney that we know of as Paul McCartney. <laughs> this is getting confusing. The guy who I guess is like the caretaker at the Paul McCartney house, like the house he grew up in, which is now kind of a museum. I guess you can pay to go in to see, you know, where Paul McCartney grew up. The caretaker there is actually the real Paul McCartney, who I guess just, he dropped out in 66 or whatever. I don't know. He didn't die. But, and there's video of people talking to this guy and, well, look, he looks like Paul. He looks like him. Like, this is what Paul would actually look like if he had lived, or which he did, I guess, because there he is. I don't know. It's crazy. I can't even explain the stuff that you can find out there on this stuff. But anyway, it, it, this is all... It, it, I don't, there's a creepiness to the whole thing. There's a really dark creepiness to the whole thing. And, I, you know, I would suggest uh, to your subscribers, who, if you have any of that are really interested in, in the whole Paul is Dead thing, I really think the series called The Winged Beetle on YouTube is really wonderful. It's, it's um, well-produced. It's low-resolution, but it's still well-produced. Um, and it's it's kind of riveting in, in a way, you know, if you want to open your mind. and I didn't find mind. it so compelling. <laughs> I really didn't. It's a lot of backward masking stuff, which I guess the Beatles were asking for with stuff like Revolution 9. They're just kind of, because they did play into it. But backward masking stuff is just nonsense. And I loathe, uh, what's his name, Michael Shermer? Shermer, you know, the self-styled skeptic who never found a government conspiracy theory that he didn't love. But anyway, um, I'll give it to him on this. I saw a video of him uh, doing his presentation where he was doing backward masking of uh, Stairway to Heaven, right? Is that where people right. you know, listen Satan backwards and hear whatever, yeah. you know, worship Satan, yeah. blah, blah, blah. And he was, uh, he was demonstrating it to this crowd. He just played it backwards and asked, can anyone identify any words? Was there any, anything you heard spoken here? And it's just gibberish. Yeah. But then he puts the words on the screen and plays it for you. And you can suddenly, you hear everything that you're reading. It's so clearly a phenomenon where uh, I just, I, whenever I see that kind of nonsense, like, look, they're clearly saying, turn me on Deadman, uh, dead man, of course, which is clearly a reference to Paul McCartney being dead, right? right? right. <laughs> right. The, uh, uh, what's that word for um, a paradoilia? Some, a paradoilia? Is that the word? 
when you visually see something and, and it looks like something else, you inter- this is the audio equivalent of that. You know, you can read into the sound and hear what you want. You know? And, you know, the thing that really got me, that what you were saying about atonal, that really is a thorn in my side. These people don't know what the fuck they're talking about. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Actually, that brings up an important point that I wanted to go over with you because um, uh, the 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 Tavistock Adorno Beatles stew was, as far as I know, it was trace. You can trace it back to John Coleman, who wrote the Conspirators Hierarchy, the Committee of Three Hundred, which is taken by some as some sort of you know important work in conspiracy lore. I don't think of it that way. Um, this is someone who claimed to be a former British intelligence officer. Citation needed. Um, who was spilling the beans on all these things, including the Beatles being created by this Tavistock Institute citation needed. Um, and I'll, I, I want to read this passage for, uh, for you, because this is where this kind of stuff starts. And then little things get added, like, oh, Adorno owned the Beatles catalog. No, he didn't. Provide, provide me one shred of proof, but people will just add on to it. But let's read from this, where he talks about this. And I'll, I'll, I'll get your musical perspective on this. Because <laughs> to me, it sounds like an old man ranting about music, the young kid's music that he doesn't <laughs> like, in much the same way as you might rant about EDM. Yes. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> uh, he writes, an outstanding example of social conditioning to accept change, even when it is recognized as unwelcome change by the large population group in the sites of the Stanford Research Institute, was the advent of the Beatles. The Beatles were brought to the United States as part of a social experiment which would subject large population groups to brainwashing, of which they were not even aware. The phenomenon of the Beatles was not a spontaneous rebellion by youth against the old social system. Instead, it was a carefully crafted plot to introduce, by a conspiratorial body which could not be identified, a highly destructive and divisive element into a large population group targeted for change against its will. New words and new phrases prepared by Tavistock, were introduced to America along with the Beatles. Words such as rock in relation to music music sounds, teenager, cool, discovered, and pop music were a lexicon of disguised code words signifying the acceptance of drugs, and they arrived with and accompanied the Beatles wherever they went to be discovered by teenagers. Incidentally, the word Teenagers was never used until just before the Beatles arrived on the scene, courtesy of the Tavistock Institute for Human Relations. Which, parenthetically, <laughs> even the person who posted this uh, this book up as a PDF puts in brackets, just so he, he can distance himself from this claim, he, John Coleman, is right about the word teenager being invented by they, and the reason why the term was invented, divide and conquer, but he's wrong about the time period, though. The concept of the teenager came about during the 1950s, actually, I think the 1940s, but 1950s, sure, along yeah. with phrases such as cool, rock and roll, etc. Bill Haley and Elvis Presley came along long before the Beatles. So even in this book, they're, <laughs> they're talking about how this isn't actually chronologically accurate. Anyway, he goes on, Coleman goes on, as in the case of gang wars, nothing could or would have been, uh, been accomplished without the cooperation of the media, especially the electronic media, and in particular, the skirt Ed Sullivan, who had been coached by the conspirators as to the role he was to play. Nobody would have paid much attention to the motley crew from Liverpool and the 12 atonal system of music that was to follow had it not been for an overabundance of press exposure. The 12 atonal system consisted of heavy, repetitive sounds taken from the music of the cult of Dionysus and the Baal priesthood by Adorno, and given a modern flavor by this special friend of the Queen of England, and hence the Committee of 300. Tavistock and its Stanford Research Center created trigger words, which then came into general usage around rock music and its fans. Trigger words created a distinct new breakaway, largely young population group, which was persuaded by social engineering and conditioning to believe that the Beatles were really their favorite group. All trigger words devised in the context of rock music were designed for mass control of the new targeted group, the Young Americans. Um, the Beatles did a perfect job, or perhaps it would be more correct to say that Tavistock and Stanford did a perfect job, the Beatles merely reacting like trained robots with a little help from their friends. <laughs> Code words for using drugs and making it cool. Uh, he goes on, but I, I thought this passage is particularly revealing. Following the Beatles who incidentally were put together by the Tavistock Institute, in case you didn't get that before, <laughs> citation needed, came other made-in-England rock groups who, like the Beatles, had Theo, Theo Adorno, Theo, he's 
He's quite casual with Theodore. <laughs> Theo Adorno, write their cult lyrics and compose all the music. Qu quotation marks, music. I hate to use these beautiful words in the context of Beatlemania. It reminds me of how wrongly the word lover is used when referring to the filthy interaction between two homosexuals writhing in pig swill. <laughs> to call rock music to call rock music is an insult. Likewise, the language used in rock lyrics. <laughs> and anyway, it goes on and on. This is literally the source that people are getting this Tavistock Adorno Beatles connection from. And then adding further nonsense, like Adorno owned the Beatles catalog on top of it. But it all sounds... I mean, if you just take it, uh, the idea out of context, out of this ridiculous hodgepodge of nonsense that he's writing, you know, Tavistock Institute and manipulating society and social relations and, you know, pop culture manufactured, all bits of that I'm sure people out there can relate to and understand, but... There's no there there when it comes to the actual evidence for any of this with regards to the Beatles. And that's that's something that should give us a little bit of pause for thought. And it actually makes me think about the Tavistock Institute as being this, this thing that you just say, the Tavistock Institute. And people will go, oh yeah, it's some kind of mind manipulation thing from London. No details provided. And it's another one of those things I keep looking into further and further and further because there's got to be some there there. Every time I try to get into the Tavistock and who they were specifically, what was this organization? Who was it founded by? What year? What did it do? What specific publications did it do? Who was funding it? It's always, oh, you know, this this Stanford research thing was actually Tavistock secretly, or or MK Ultra had a lot of scientists who were also Tavistock, or things like this. It's always these connections that are kind of vague and left hanging so that it's never brought back to an actual, here's a document, here's a person, here's a name, here's something you can go to. It's always this kind of amorphous web of just say the name Tavistock, and then say the Beatles, and then say manufacturing culture, and everyone will just kind of believe it without having anything to actually base it. Wow, James, wow, wow. I, I mean, I personally don't trust any institution for social engineering at all, and I think there must be something funky about Tavistock, you know, um, I agree. I just want to know why. Yeah, you and no one will ever yeah, say the. You what. haven't been able to crack the code, then, huh? Like crack through and and get to the real facts. I've about seen a lot of stuff out there, but nothing. I mean, there's a lot of real names and real people and real events, but Tavistock, I don't think, is the linchpin key to all of this. Mm. It has to do with this group that we're looking at cybernetics, and there was Rockefeller funding, there was Stanford research, there was CIA and MK Ultra. there was also Tavistock, but it's just, it's this thing that I think is being referred to by this one name, right. so that everyone kind of just concentrates on that one name rather than kind of the bigger picture of what's being painted here. And look, I'm, I do believe, yes, a lot of mass culture is fabricated for the purpose of changing and directing society and giving directions. And I do think the 60s counterculture was at the very... Steered. If not completely steered. controlled, at least steered mm -hmm. towards a direction mm -hmm. that would be, you know, useful for the power structure, Weird. etc. But... Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The, the book yeah. Weird Tales from okay. the Canyon kind of suggests that steering. And I think he's a pretty decent researcher. I think he, he digs up facts. Um, but let's talk about this idea. Now... In contemporary times, it's pretty. It's I think it's pretty factual. I have to really research it, but I've I've heard before from like maybe even um, what's his name Rick uh, Beato might have mentioned it that there are two guys right now that are writing the majority of of uh, pop electronic dance music, popular electronic music, um, and when you listen to the pop music, you could say to yourself, well, that's plausible. I mean, there's not much difference between songs. There's not much unusual things going on. There are not any idol breakers, you know? It just seems to... So when you think about that, let's look at someone like Theodore Adorno. Not only did he write the Beatles music, but he wrote the music for other bands as well, the Kinks and the Who, and wow, guy's prolific. And Led Zeppelin, apparently, who I guess weren't copying, you know, old dead blues guys. No, they were copying Theodore Adorno. Yeah, right? We knew all about old dead blues guys, by the way. You know? guys. Yeah, exactly. Um, right? No, but, you know, okay, let's look at the plausibility of this, which to me is just so out of the ballpark. This guy, first of all, I've read that passage before. I'm very familiar with that one. And uh, this use of the word atonal, when a person isn't educated and they use musical terms that they don't know about, 
that really gets to me. Like, I can see why you'd be frustrating, frustrated in general when you're doing your research and, you know, conspiracy theorists saying this or that or the other thing. And you're going, but no, wait a second. Here's the research. Here's, here's, the, here's the documentation. It's similar for me, like when I hear musical terms thrown about and people don't know what the hell they're talking about. Um, all right. So Theodore Adorno, supposedly, let's just take it that he wrote the Beatles music. OK, he would have to create literally characters. He'd have to create a George Harrison character, a Paul McCartney character and a John Lennon character. Why do I say that? For example, in an early Beatles song called You're Going to Lose That Girl, John makes you an interesting and unusual use of the three dominant seven chord, or what's called five seven of six. Um, you could find John using that same appurtenance years and years and years later on Abbey Road. All right. So Theodore Adorno had to say, well, this is John Lennon's character. He likes to use this chord here. You know, John Lennon had a penchant for writing. Uh, horizontal melodies, and Paul had a penchant for writing vertical, like big leaps and melodies, where John would stay on the same note. An example of the same note thing would be I Am the Walrus, you know. Um, Paul, uh, I was alone, I took a ride, I didn't know what I would find. Eh, big jumps all around. So Theodore Adorno would have to take that into account. This is the way Paul writes. But wait, the way George writes, you know. Well, George has this similar to John, but he has this penchant for sour notes and odd little chords, you know, this sort of thing. And then, and then even Ringo, you know, <laughs> you know. Yeah. They all had their own styles. And, and of course all the other bands that he apparently wrote for as well, like Led Zeppelin and whatever, they all had their own styles. So he wrote in everyone's style, but also again, another example of people not knowing what they don't know, maybe 30 years ago, this kind of thing would have been plausible to, to someone who's just hearing it. But now that we have the access to the archival documents and, and records that we have, um, now we have to believe that Adorno not only wrote every song of the Beatles or the, the important ones or whatever, but he also wrote the demo version stages that we now can <laughs> listen to. I would invite people to go and listen to uh, the demos for She Said, She Said off a of Revolver. It is fascinating to me to hear John doing his original demo of this song, which was kind of this Dylan-esque kind of thing going on. And you can hear through a couple of different demos that he obviously did over a period of months, you can hear the song evolve into what became She Said, She Said. You can hear the evolution of, of psychedelic rock. It, it, you can hear the birth of it in these demos. It's incredible. It's amazing. But I guess... You know, Adorno wrote every stage of that. He wrote the original demo, and then he wrote, now, John, you're going to have to record this demo to show that you made some progress in the song. Then you're going to have to record this demo to show that you're, you're coming up with this idea, and then we're going to write, write the one that's going to be used in the studio, and you're going to record these, and, you know, 30 years later, they'll be available on the internet as a bootleg. <laughs> I mean, again, this is the level we have to go to. And, and now, I mean, when they come out with uh, the Sgt. Pepper re-release or whatever, you can listen to the original take of Strawberry Field, the original demo, and then the demo that they first did in the studio on the four track, and then the, the different takes that they did that they then merged together to create the one that we now know. Again, we have so much material to show the evolution and the birth and the writing of these songs by these artists in this room that you, you cannot sta just state, oh yeah, Adorno wrote it. Because you would have to take into account all of these things that we now know that people didn't know they didn't know, you know, 30 years ago. See, that's a, you're a big fan, right? And so am I. And in fact, I think their music bordered on sublime at some times, literally. And I'm sorry, but I'd be kissing Theodore Adorno's ass right now, dead ass, if he actually wrote all that stuff, okay? Um, it To me, like all the conspiracy theories, when you think about them around the Beatles— one thing I'm sorry I cannot buy into is that these guys didn't write their own freaking music. They wrote that music, and they did an amazing job of it. That What you're talking about, she said, she said, to me, it's such a wonderful exploration to follow the steps to see the evolution of the song and how it became what it became. That's my dream in life. I mean, I wish that I was a fly on the wall for all this writing and how they developed it. You know, I, it, just unbelievable. And try to write a song as good as the Beatles. You know, uh, right. It's uh, really, really, really. Listen hard. to uh, 
really hard. Listen to John's, I think he did in the 70s, the recording that we have, but it's the idea that he came up with for help, which is this really plaintive, slow kind of, you know, it's a it's a cry for help, right. literally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and you hear it in that 70s recording we have of it, which was more of like what he originally wrote. But then, you know, George Martin comes and can we have something yeah. snappier, for like a number one single? Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. let's make it into a number one single. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I mean, it, it, again, that sort of stuff is fascinating. But again, is the kind of stuff that people who come along and read, you know, watch a YouTube video and think they're experts on the Beatles, <laughs> you don't know what you don't yeah, know. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Thing. Yeah, that's uh, that's why this this whole podcast concept I think is perfect for you and I. I mean, it really is because you're the incredible researcher into conspiracies, and I'm the incredible researcher into music theory and how and Beatles. You know, and we both share those common elements. And by the way, you know, you, you when you introduced this uh, earlier, you, you mentioned how we met on the internet. Do you remember that when you showed up, I went to your, your YouTube channel and I went, oh, this guy's a conspiracy theorist, uh, for lack of a better word anyway. And uh, James, you didn't know that I was. So here was a thing where we're both Beatles fans and we're both conspiracy theory <laughs> fans. I thought that was pretty cosmic myself. So it was something. <laughs> it, yeah, it is. Uh, there's definitely a synchronicity there anyway. But uh, all right. Uh, but, all right. So, OK, uh, wrapping up the subject of manufacturing of culture, which we can't possibly do in <laughs> a little conversation like this. But so you say Sergeant Pepperish is where the turn started and there was some sort of darker influence on Beatles music. I would certainly say Yoko was a dark influence. And uh, there's some some suggestion of something. Yeah, there's something weird about Yoko Ono that I, there, yeah. I just don't know, but uh, there's something weird. And by the way, uh, the Paul is dead. Heather Mills, his ex-wife, said that she knew something about Paul that would be devastating to the public. However, she yeah. could have been very much playing on the Paul is dead idea. Yeah. You know, she could have been playing on well, it. Well, what does that... Yeah, it. but everyone sees that through the lens of Paul is dead when they're looking at Paul is dead, but that could mean... Literally, could anything. have been a woman beater. He's a rapist. Yeah, He's yeah, a whatever. Yeah, yeah, he secretly yeah, murdered yeah. someone, and whatever. I mean, again, it could mean anything. This sexual but fetish. Paul is dead. Yeah. I think it's clearly Paul is dead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's, let's go to the steering factor. Now, here's my feeling. I sent you a photo today, right? Um, of John holding up the uh, the devil horns and Paul doing the six 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 symbol, right? both in the same photograph. And to me, that's like, wow, that's a little, gives you pause, you know? Uh, Cause you know, all the, all the Illuminati, when you ever want to, whatever you want to call them, insiders use those symbols. They use those hand symbols. That strikes me. So, well, and they, there's a lot of uh, hidden hand. Uh, a lot of hidden of hand. Paul Andrew. Yeah. Which is what, that's Masonic. Is it uh, that one? I believe yeah. so. The hidden hand. What a, that's very poetic actually. Um, well, yeah, I think it's a literal, mm -hmm. they hide your hand, your hidden mm -hmm. hand, or, you know, yeah. it's right in your face. But again, most people, if they don't know it, they don't see it. Right? <laughs> that reminds me of, <laughs> this has nothing to do with anything, but I was doing a show on a stage that was all black, right? And I, uh, I was, I'm playing along and somebody was asked from behind me and all you could see were their hands. So it's a spooky image of like these hands moving, you know, while I'm performing. Uh, sorry about that. Anyway, let's get back. So it's the unhidden hand, but hidden everything else. <laughs> now that that photo I sent you was around the time of the release of Yellow Submarine was well into the Beatle maturity. Um, probably around the time that they started thinking about breaking up even, you know, um, or just right on the cusp of that. But um, my belief is anybody Anybody who makes great success in terms of money, power, or influence, which the Beatles had all three in spades, anybody, that catches the eyes and ears of these guys up top. And they say, whoa, 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 these guys are having a huge influence on the youth of America and the world. We have to take control of this. Because really, their one earmark, these guys, is that they're control freaks. You know, that they want to control everything that has connected uh, connection to power and money. So I believe that. So and that's, believe that's the thing. That it's so much more plausible that 
that the way that these power structures would function is to find people with genuine talent and ability that they can then steer towards exactly. their own purposes. Rather than, exactly. uh, we will write everything you do and you will just be performing monkeys on a stage. That is so much less efficient, yeah. plausible, mm -hmm. yeah. realistic. Right. No, you find people with real talent and then you make sure they're doing your bidding or you destroy them. That's, that's how it would work. I have a buddy in Sweden who seems to have some connection inside of all this stuff. And uh, one day I did say to him, I said, I don't think they, they create these situations. I think they see a trend appearing. And when the trend appears, they start to move it around. And he gave me like a resounding yes with a few exclamation points. Um, so I think that's – now, Pepper – it took a year, and granted, it was a, a work of art. It would make sense that the damn thing took a year. But otherwise, something could have been going on behind the scenes around that time where these influencers stepped in. And I don't think they even come out and say, uh, you know, you need to do this. I think they more or, more or less kind of like they induct them into their little club. And they get influenced just by virtue of being connected with the club. And uh, I think what happens at that point is uh, just influence, just subtle influence, just conversation happens. And, you know, and it's always under the guise of this is for the benefit of everybody. This is for everyone's good. It, it always seems to be under this particular guise, like, you know, the, the whole thing about for your security. Right. We'll we'll create a, a police state for you. You know, so. It seems to go into this guise. I mean, I have personal contact with somebody who's in the Council on Foreign Relations, and he's the sweetest guy in the world. His family is wonderful, you know. But I, I spoke to my friend in Sweden about this guy, and he said, "Well, he's probably one of their useful um, tools." You know, he doesn't really know what's yeah. going on. Yeah, circles within circles, and the outer circle might think they're a part of one club, and the inner circle is. A whole different thing, and this is the uh, the Quigley formula that uh, Edward Griffin, mm -hmm. uh, G. Edward Griffin, talked about. That is extremely pertinent because these larger organizations, the CFRS, thousands of members, uh, some of whom are going to be useful idiots to an agenda that they don't even know exists. Yep. yep. Uh, yep. So it's unfortunately, yeah, I, yeah. Anyway, so it, there's clearly some sort of and, uh, but uh, yeah, I guess could we make the 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 case that, oh, it's just, you know, artists being artist kind of thing, because you got the butcher cover kind of stuff. They were just playing around. They were just being silly. They were just being stupid. And they went too far, right? They went too far. Or was there an agenda? Yeah. No, behind? George Harrison commented on that. He said, you know, we were, we were naive and silly and we did stupid things. And that was one of them. That's the way he put it. It, it was just a stupid idea, you know? Yeah. Well, I don't think anyone would argue that was necessarily part of the agenda because they immediately recalled it and covered it up. Literally covered Literally. it up. Literally. Of course, you can buy Literally. some of the original butcher covers that it, you can peel. Yeah, off for the, thousands uh, of dollars, probably. They're, they're like real collector's items. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, well, I don't have any of those. But, uh, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but there, you know, if... All right. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Go on. No, no, no. I was just going to say there's a certain darkness that seems to fall when we when we begin with peppers. Before that, there's a lot of sunny sunlight, and after that, as goofy and silly as the Beatles could be, there was always this dark edge that seemed to remain with them after. And to me, it's no surprise darkness breeds darkness that uh, you know a character like Charles Manson would latch onto a Beatles song and yeah. you know. Yeah. And believe that they were that's a, yeah, and that brings in the Laurel Canyon thing, which is a whole other conversation that we should probably have at another time. But yeah, there's clearly that darkness to it. Um, I would argue maybe you're seeing it through that lens of Paul is dead and everything post Pepper, so that's where the darkness starts. But Revolver, I would say, was there on Revolver. Um, a song like uh, I'm Only Sleeping, you start to get the sense that there's that change happening, not just the psychedelic sense, but the kind of the darkness coming in. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, I, I get what you're saying there. I, I, to me, when I when I speak of darkness, I mean an out the hidden hand element coming in. Mm, I, right, I don't think okay. that really started to happen until Sergeant Pepper. But um, but John was, you know, look, John was dark from the beginning. I mean, think of all the songs he wrote about, you know, death. Uh, even when they were. Brand new, Babies in Black, you know, 
she doesn't love me because she's mourning the death of her lover. You know, um, please don't wear red. What, what's that song? Oh, don't. Yeah. Don't wear red tonight. Yes. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Uh, another one, you know. So, John, you know, he was obviously really affected by his mother's death and death was on his mind, you know. So John was dark from the beginning. He, you know, dark in the sense of he wasn't afraid to go there with his popular music, you know, which was, you know, okay. it's, wow, that's a... Well, yeah, so many things that we can continue exploring for a hundred hours here, but let's, then let's end up on that spot with John and obviously his death, um, conspiracy related to that. Mark David Chapman? Yeah. Yeah, that's a... Uh, the jerk of all jerks, yeah. as he's been Yeah, called. by Paul McCartney, that was... Uh, um, yeah, I mean, I read the stuff, you know, about he was carrying a copy of uh, Catcher in the Rye and he was monarch, you know, created killer. I, you know, during that period, one thing that really does kind of spook me, really spooks me, is that um, there's a great YouTube of May paying his girlfriend between the Yoko Ono sandwich. Um, there's a great interview with her where she talks about like him and her were, were tight. They were doing good. They were happy together. And then Yoko called him and, and said, um, you've got to see this hypnotherapist. We got to get you to quit smoking, you know, and supposedly like, according to May Pang, John was a different person after he saw that hypnotherapist. And that kind of gives me the willies. That really does. That yeah. really does. There are testimonies from a number of different people who said that John was a different person person when Yoko was around like they would it was the old John that they remembered and they were having a good time and then Yoko would be in the room and he'd be like a robot kind of thing and that, this isn't coming from one or two people there's multiple people who have attested this yeah so that's a that's a bit of an odd thing now, coming from Japan uh, you know a conceptual artist what connection would she have to you know the 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 big boys, the power boys. The yeah. boys the well, the international jet setting crowd tends to uh, all moves together, so it's not out of the realm of possibility. And she came from a rich family that I don't know much about, but clearly probably had some connections. Yeah, it could be some interesting research, but yeah, something. She was dark. She had a dark energy, and I, you know, if I had a choice between Yoko and May, I'd go for May, and I'd marry her right now. I mean, she was sweet and gorgeous and really lovable person. Yeah, I I mean this. Yeah, I, and I grew up in the uh, in the era where clearly the John and Yoko fantasy story had been firmly cemented, and it was John and Yoko Inc. So I grew up thinking that any criticism of Yoko was just racism and it was right, just you right. know knee jerk, and there's nothing right, to it. Right. I, it's only in recent years when I've really started to research it, I find oh no, there's a lot of really shady and, and questionable things with Yoko and her connections and whatever she was involved with, witchcraft and otherwise. Oh really. She was into some okay. dark stuff. Wow. We've we got to talk about that sometime. Yeah. We will. Yeah. I think this is conversation yeah. is not in an end. <laughs> but <laughs> we've been talking for over okay. an hour. We've got to call it. A large portion of the audience is probably tuned out by now. <laughs> no, well, <laughs> I'm having a good time. <laughs> All right. Anything else? Any other conspiracy stuff you want to hit on before we close up? Uh, probably I'll remember after we close up. So no big deal. Yeah, yeah no exactly. Me too. I'm sure. Let me actually, let me just check my notes because there might've been something that I really wanted to bring up. Um, uh, oh, that's pretty much it. Oh, again, there's so much. One more. thing. Did you know that Paul McCartney was a conspiracy theorist? No. And in fact, this is factual stuff. This is, this is documented. Um, I'll just read this to you. Uh, a through his twenties, Paul McCartney was a bit obsessed with the obsession of John F. Kennedy, according to author and former New York State legislator Mark Lane. McCartney took particular interest in, in his book *Rush to Judgment* um, and had phone calls with Lane about whether Lee Harvey Oswald had committed the assassination or not. And the interesting thing is, they they did a were producing a movie based on his book, and McCartney volunteered to do the music for it. And uh, wow. they uh, rejected the idea because they thought that Paul, this was a really heavy subject, and they thought Paul was too sprightly, and his name appended to something so heavy wouldn't fly well. 
Interesting. I never that knew that. That, yeah, that was a new one. And contrast yeah. that with uh, Tom Hanks, who wants to you know bring the official JFK story to the masses and narrate uh, documentaries and stuff on that. So there you go. Interesting. I never knew that. I did know that John Lennon saw a UFO. Yes. And he ain't too surprised. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But of course, there was a conspiracy theory appended to that, that he actually had a first an encounter with aliens. And there's some really spurious quote that he supposedly said about these guys. <laughs> yeah, I never heard yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> but he did put it in a song, yeah. so we know that he no, at least No, he did, and experience. it's fascinating. May Payne talks about it in that interview. She talks about their UFO sighting. It's awesome. It's really wonderful. Yeah, let's include that in the show notes if we can dig that out. I know I've seen it before, but we'll try to dig it out for the show notes. Also, I'm going to put in... Um, uh, it was a great little mockumentary, I guess you would call it, about uh, Paul is Dead. I've never seen this. I think it's I've called Who Is This Now? A Paul is Dead documentary. And it's uh, a filmmaker, and he's playing a character of someone who's really into Paul is Dead, and he's showing all of these clues to his friends. And I won't spoil it, because I think it's well, really well done, but it kind of changes at the end. Anyway, is it a British watch thing? the documentary. British I think it's fascinating. Made? Is it British? Made? No? Nope. Okay. It's an American. Oh, cool. no, I'll check it out. Yeah, yeah please do. Send it my way. Or maybe Canadian, I don't know. Anyway, yeah. one of us. <laughs> All right, and uh, and uh, yeah, I think that'll do for now. Again, there's so much. There's more so much, and I'm sure there will so be uh, there will be a few uh, very passionate people in the comments, and then a lot of people who wondering why we're talking about this at all. But hey, <laughs> that's the nature yeah. of this. So now let's direct people once again to vincognito.net, right? Uh, Vin. Well, my website is virtually, you know, it just sits there nowadays. Um, it's a, I built it in uh, Macromedia, Macromedia Flash yeah. back in the day. So it's pretty yeah, old. Exactly. You can't view it on a phone. But Vin Oh, sorry, vincognito.com. Vincognito.com. My YouTube is for YouTube forward slash Vincognito. Um, and where can people get the uh, album? Yeah, that's problematic at this point because we still have, we're going to, me and my producer are getting together this week to sort out the CD baby problem. And then it will be available. So if you want to plug me in the future. <laughs> well, we'll include a link to your CD Baby page where people can already get your loop. Um, uh, uh, actually, that is that is uh, no longer. I think that account just died. I don't know what happened, but I went there and there were there was no music. There was no me. It just it, right. so. Well, when you get the CD Baby situation sorted out, pass it along and I'll put it in the Thank show Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, anyway, we're going to leave it there for today. We could talk for 100 hours, and we probably will, yep. <laughs> on or off yep. air. Yep. <laughs> but anyway, that'll do for today. Uh, Vinny Caggiano, thank you so much for your time. Great today. pleasure, James, always, and thank you, too. One hundred years ago, the most devastating war the world had ever seen came to an end. In the craters of those battlefields lay the fallen. But why? What was World War I about? What did it mean? For a century, we have been told a partial history of that war. But now, we can finally learn the truth about the First World War. This is false history. It's not even acceptable to call it fake news. It's just disgusting. So what these people gained was the foothold for world government. And now the time came to slaughter some part of the sheep. The World War I Conspiracy. Watch the documentary for free at CorbettReport.com slash WWI.